I think Labour has to hold on very, very firm to being the party that's going to deliver a carbon-free future. It's a pretty straightforward, if, if we ask an audience, what is Labour's economic policy? This is the real flagship. Well, what they're going to do is they're going to massively increase tax. Welcome to the Restless Politics Question Time with me, Rory Stewart. And me, Alistair Campbell. So where do you want to start, Rory? Well, start with a big one from Ben Storer. Why is Labour rolling back its pledge on green investment? This is one of the policies that got me really actually excited for a Labour government, and it's also pretty popular from what I can tell. Surely this makes Labour seem weak and less serious about the future of this country. So just context on this. Um, Labour famously pledged that it were going to be investing £28 billion every year in the green economy. Then they sort of take that back a bit and said maybe they do it halfway through the term. And now it slightly looks as though they're not really committing to when they're going to do it at all. And that's presumably because they're worried about the fiscal position. But anyway, over to you. Well, funny enough, I was at an event at the Union Chapel last night, launching the paperback of my book, Rory, which, as you know, is called... Uh, oh, very good. But what can I do? Where I did reveal to them that your yes. book, yes. Politics on the Edge, has outsold mine. Well, that's so, very generous of you. Well done on that. Um, yep. But what was interesting was how many people were asking that very question or questions related to it. And there's a couple of things I'd say on this. The first is, I don't quite know how they've got themselves into this, will they, won't they, around a number that if I'm right, I think Rachel Reeves first used in a Labour Party conference speech. And since when there's been this sort of never ending, feels like a tug of war, but I can't quite work out who's on either side of the rope. But, I'm, you know, my very, very strong advice is particularly given that after the Uxbridge by-election, Rishi Sunak signalled himself trying to move away from the kind of, you know, green credentials agenda. I think Labour has to hold on very, very firm to being the party that's going to deliver um, a, a, a carbon-free future. And so I think that um, I get why they want, you know, they might worry about the numbers and they might worry about being attacked. But equally, you know, we've talked before about this thing about the, the so-called small target. Um, if you don't get attacked for policy, people don't know what your policies are. And that yeah. is one of the questions that I kept getting last night is that I want, it was people basically, look, they're coming out to hear me and, you know, get a copy of the book and, or, and have a natter and all that stuff. They, they basically wanted to vote Labour, I would have said. Most of them wanted to vote Labour, I think. And I actually made the point that in most elections that I've lived through, you have a feeling often that when a government's got the power of incumbency, but people are a bit fed up with them, they're moving away, but then people are looking for reasons not to vote for the opposition. I think at the moment the mood is that people are desperately looking for reasons to vote for the opposition as part of the whole sort of time for a change thing and fed up with the Tories. So I think Labour has, has got to stop worrying so much about being attacked and actually start giving people more positive reasons so that people say, that is why I'm voting Labour. And, and there's a very fundamental thing here, isn't there, which is that they are a party that wants to position themselves as anti-austerity, pro-growth. So their whole story is that the Tories cut too much unnecessarily and it damaged the economy mm -hmm. and that the way to get the economy going again is to make some smart investments and in, in this case in, in green energy and their story is this is going to create jobs it's going to be the industries of the future so they're talking about investing for example in batteries for electric vehicles changing the power setup in Britain so it's a powerful story which has a lot of appeal to many economists, particularly economists who are more on the left, who think that Britain has been starved of investment. There's a big, big story that keeps coming up, you know, even in the right-wing press, about how Britain doesn't invest as mm. much as other European countries in its infrastructure and its skills and all this kind of stuff. So it's a pretty straightforward, if, if we ask an audience, what is Labour's economic policy? This is the real flagship. Well, what they're going to do is they're going to massively increase investment and they're going to invest heavily in the industries of the future, which is going to give Britain a cutting edge. Now, whether that's whether that's right or not, and I can imagine some right-wing economists listening to that saying, boo rubbish, that's the wrong way to go. But I would have thought it's a, it's a clear, strong message that, mm. that 
a lot of people support and they should hold to. I mean, just to give a sense of the debate that is going on. So um, Phil Collins, who used to work with us um, in government and now writes a column in The Times, and he had a column the other day. I'm just going to give you the headline. It said, Labour must ditch the £28 billion pledge to be heard. And the point that he was making is that on the day that Labour had this really big conference with business and there were 400 business leaders all paying to be there and desperate to hear what Keir Starmer and Rachel Rees had to say. And he said that as they, as the ministers were doing, the shadow ministers were doing the media rounds, all they got was this, will they, won't they? And you know, they're in trouble. I, I always think this with the Tory ministers, whenever they're onto the, that line, we've been very clear that, <laughs> you, you know that they're basically, they're not being very clear. And so the, on this, this specific issue, they have to sit around a table, resolve it once and for all. And then, as you say, have a much bigger message that is rooted in what's going to be in the manifesto about how they're going to invest in the industry of the future. And I get the complications. So, for example, we were out for dinner the other night with a local government leader who was telling us about some really interesting plans that they had, not just her council, but other councils as well. Is this is this Miss Gould? By it is Miss Gould. It is Miss Gould yeah. in Camden, yeah. And but she's she's sort of you know part of the whole infrastructure of councils working together, so they're working on all sorts of different projects, and they're talking to government, and they're talking to business. And by the way, I've been surprised at how many business people who you might think some of them, some of them are actually defected to Labour, like that guy from Iceland and that guy Ian Anderson the other day, but people who are probably still basically on the right, but who are desperate for Labour to do this because they believe this thing about, you know, a pound of public uh, public sector investment can lead to three pounds of, of private sector investment. What Georgia was saying is that actually there aren't necessarily all the projects there that will justify up to £28 billion pound per year as it goes forward. But anyway, the fact is, Phil Collins, in my view, is both right and wrong. I'm being both right and wrong. I just think they've got to resolve it and then one way or another yeah and yeah. stop being on the, the back foot about it well, isn't and that, then have a, a bigger message isn't that the basic rule in politics that sometimes more important than which side of the fence you come down on you've got to get off the fence you've got to have a clear view that it's often the worst of all worlds to end up in a kind of muddled indistinct position yeah and if um, you don't if you don't have if you don't have lots of other policies that people are talking about then you know, inevitably, they're going to focus on those that... Now, Labour will say, we have lots of policies. And it's true. If you read the, the last policy document they did, there are tons of policy in there. But I'm talking about policy that is, if you like, is connecting with the public. And if you're in opposition, it only connects with the public. If you are very clear about what it is and you campaign on it relentlessly, you only get heard in the campaign if actually you are being attacked by the media and by the, by your opponents, in this case, the Tories. And infrastructure is, is, is the obvious one, isn't it? Um, Raoul Ruparel, who was um, very much at the centre of Theresa May's attempt to get her soft Brexit through, has produced a report now on Britain's infrastructure uh, with BCG, the consultancy group. And he mm -hmm. points out that Britain is spending over eight million for every kilometre of road compared to about France spends about half of that. In other words, France can build twice as many roads for the same price. Now, there, there are reasons for that. Right? I mean, France is a less densely populated country and maybe different planning rules. But there is so much potential there. If, if Labour could get right a train line between Leeds and Manchester, for example, or really sort out the bus systems, it sounds like a small thing, but getting buses right oh, yeah. in cities in the north will make a especially, huge difference. Especially, especially now I've got my Freedom Pass. Really. No, especially now you've got Freedom Pass. And I was on the Elizabeth Line off to get my passport done with a kind of shout out to the passport office not just me it wasn't some weird special treatment thing everybody who's been to get a new passport recently has been very impressed by that is a bit of government that's working but it's also an example of how a bit of infrastructure that new elizabeth line has suddenly opened up completely yeah. whole new areas of the city and you can imagine suddenly housing um businesses and everything are going to be promoted if we could do that in northern england you've really got something possible but the question as we keep talking about is not just can Labour put the money into it, but can they produce a good story about how they're going to be able to build it more quickly mm. and more cheaply than governments have been able to for the last 20 years? Well, here's a, here's a, a related question. Away. Sandra Foy, how easy would it be for Keir Starmer, if elected, to dismantle the free ports being set up by Rishi Sunak and his cronies? If so, do you think he will? Um, 
I don't know the answer. I don't know how easy it would be, but I do feel there is a growing stench around this. Um, a shout out to a few journalists. A very small number of journalists have really been working at this. Richard Brooks at Private Eye, Jen Williams, um, who's at the FT. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a couple of um, sites up in the north um, that have been really, really good. Yorkshire Post has been very good. But I actually think this whole thing about Teasworks we talked about it briefly, but I think at some point we should actually do a big number on this, Rory, because I, I sort of feel very, very uneasy. And it relates to this um, point that I talked about many, many times about the, the William Rees Mogg vision of the sovereign individual. This is about people carving out parts of the country which will not necessarily be governed in the way that we think our country is meant to be governed and the systems that we've all signed up to. And I think that the, the traditional Treasury response to this, which I really support, is to say that if the things you're doing in the free ports make sense and are justifiable, you should do them across the whole country. There's no point just creating these kind of tiny little pockets of economic activity. If, there's, if you believe in the particular regulations you're getting rid of or the tax incentives you're offering, do it more broadly. Don't just sort of pick off little bits. The reason they did it in places like China was because it was almost structurally impossible to imagine those reforms outside Shenzhen and these mm. other special economic zones. But in Britain, it, it shouldn't be necessary to do it. Um, here's, here's a question for you from Alex Reed. I'm putting my hand up as your one download in Tuvalu. <laughs> I was working there in January on a visit to prepare support for new MPs after the election. I listened during a morning run in the one open space for exercise in Funafuti the airport runway. I'm sure new MPs would be very happy if you both came to Tuvalu to speak to them. My question is, what advice would you give to MPs in a small and geographically isolated country? So to remind people, the population of Tuvalu is about 10,000 people to project their voice on the world stage, especially on issues such as the impact of climate change. In other words, the population of Tuvalu is about half the population of my local town of Creef. Yeah. And, and what, what, just, just to those who didn't listen last week, I insisted last week that we talk, because this is elections year, that we talk about the elections in Tuvalu. And I I said there was a sort of geostrategic significance because the outgoing prime minister was very, as it were, on the American side of things and the new uh, his replacement is reckoned to be a bit more pro-China. Um, I think I've got that right. Um, but Rory, if we do give advice to Tuvalu's new MPs, it will have to be through other than the podcast because... So excited was I about the fact that we had that one listener in Tuvalu. Yeah. I assumed we'd get more because we were talking about Tuvalu. Yeah. But I've just checked last week's listenership in Tuvalu was zero. It's it's very sad. And that's because presumably Alex Reed got on that plane <laughs> from Funafuti <laughs> and left after his thing. And so he's he's no longer there. Um, he did he sorry, did point I, out I, I, he did point can I just out, clarify, I've I've being stupid, it's half the population of Penrith, and it's about it's just larger than the population of my town, Creef, but it's it would register as a pretty small market town. Yeah, in yeah. I should also say, I think he also pointed out in his very kind email to out himself as our Tuvalu listener um, that, and this goes back to the the point about you know how these so many of these issues are, co are connected. That Australia has said it will take people from Tuvalu if, as it were, their entire location and existence becomes threatened by climate change. Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, Tuvalu is very much on the front line of that, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Orban, Statlevald, what did Viktor Orban get out of dragging his heels on support package for Ukraine? Was Tusk involved? Brighter Political Times, that part of Europe, which up until recently would have had you in a state of despair. So this is a good news story. And I think it's good because it keeps listeners up to date on stories that we raise and and sometimes I'm worried we don't always complete. So we told listeners about the fact are you saying, that- Are you all, saying, Roy, that we don't conduct this podcast with journalistic rigor? Oh, I'm total journalistic <laughs> rigor, but sometimes we don't always finish a story that we've begun. So the yeah. story that we began was that Orban was delaying the approval of the EU budgetary support to Ukraine. And the update is that the EU has taken that support through and Orban didn't in the end hold it up. He um, didn't he didn't well, even put up a fight really. Um he there's a very good picture that was circulating last week of him 
in the around, around this table and let me just get this right who was there Schultz was there Maloney was there Macron was there Charles Michel was there and Ursula von der Leyen was there and it really was a sort of picture of the the big guys getting in the room and picking on the little guy um and I think what was going on there was saying look you know we let you get away with this once but you're not going to do it twice and I think they were probably making clear that if he if he did it again there were all sorts of measures that they could take against Hungary um, so he backed down pretty quickly, I would say. And I, I think that is a good thing for the European Union because he's been, you know, he's been playing his games for far too long. He'll be back, though. He'll be back. Quick question on Tusk. I mean, we, we've talked about Tusk and what's happening in Poland a bit, but it continues to be the case, of course, that the president is who's from the Law and Justice Party, the Populist Right Party, and is in there for at least another year, is continuing to block stuff that Tusk is trying to do, you know, delaying legislation, trying to stop a budget, stopping Tusk's attempt to get rid of ju judges from the court. Um, so that that remains difficult. Although, of course, Tusk has, I think, a majority in both houses, which should help him through with some of the stuff. Has he got a majority in both houses? I believe so, yeah. Oh, I believe so. Okay. Now, Rory, here's one that's sort of aimed at me, but I, I think is interesting for you to have a think about as well. Nick Daniels. Alistair often interjects or responds to Rory's points with the words no, but, which can appear very negative, argumentative and hostile. May I suggest, says Nick Daniels, the more constructive yes and as a better <laughs> communication technique for building conversation and disagreeing agreeably. So first of all, Rory, do you feel that I say no, but? No, I, I, think, I, I don't think you do that very much, is she? I don't do it as I, often I don't as you do very good. I don't don't recognise it that much. Good, good. No, good. I don't recognise that much, um, but I, I like the idea of yes and yeah. Yes, although it and. might be a bit. Although it might be a bit annoying if I thought you were doing it in a completely fake way when you obviously yeah, meant you, no but. Exactly, exactly. So I think I'm going to stick with no but, um, even though, as you say, I don't say it very much. Now, yes, Alistair, and the question of Biden's <laughs> sanctions, <laughs> Harriet Mackay, and and I, I'm going to combine this with Patrick Walker. So Harriet Mackay, what? does Biden's sanction against Israeli settlers mean in reality? And Patrick Walker, what do you think a Cameron suggests in the UK would recognise Palestine as a state and what effect would this actually have? Over to you on those two. Well, on the sanctions, essentially what it means is that those people who are named um, will not be able to travel to the United States. Um, I think that's what it means. And in relation to, I thought the Cameron thing, I, I, can't, I still can't work out whether that was a very deliberate act of uh, foreign policy or whether number 10 were a bit angrier with him for going a bit freelance. Um, but it was greeted with um, considerable favour in yeah. the Palestinian community for obvious well, it's, reasons. It's, it, it's an amazing thing that he did there. So just again for listeners, um, David Cameron, the, the UK Foreign Secretary and ex-Prime Minister, said in a meeting um, that he thought that Britain should consider recognising the Palestinian state early. And, and this is a big, big change in policy because traditionally full recognition of Palestinian statehood was something that was supposed to be held back till the end of the peace process as one of the kind of rewards for the peace process. Um, I think it's symbolically hugely important because along with Biden's emphasis on the two-state solution, it makes it very clear now that even amongst Israel's strongest supporters and the UK and the US are, are clearly right up there. It is non-negotiable for them, this two-state solution, and that puts them absolutely at odds with the position now that, that Netanyahu and his government are in, where they're mm. very much you know, openly rejecting a two-state solution. Um, the, I, I was also very struck, we got a, someday we should probably discuss it, but we got a very, very angry email from an Israeli listener who mm. felt strongly that we weren't remotely empathizing with what happened on October the 7th or with what he described as the care that Israeli soldiers were taking. And in it also, he suggested that the next step would be for Israel to go after Hezbollah in Lebanon. Mm. And now I don't know how seriously to take all that, but it, it was a real reminder of how incredibly painful this is and how polarized mm. this is and how very difficult it is to get a common conversation. I mean, I, I've got friends who are at, 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 living in North London who 
saying to me they can't bear to listen to the podcast anymore because they feel that when we talk about what's happening in Gaza, we're encouraging anti-Semitism and that we're not speaking enough about threats to Jewish communities and anti-Semitism in Britain. And I had another meeting with some uh, some of the Church of England, some some people that you'd know, in, in fact, um, last week, including, including your friend, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who's now in Ukraine. Yeah. Um, and who suggested that he would be willing to come on the podcast, which would be interesting. Rory, he's been but, saying it for a year, and then he keeps telling me that his press office are the, are the block. So, you know, uh, come on, Justin, well, let's get a move on. Let's get him on. Um, anyway, one of the things that was said, not, not by him, but somebody else who's working in interfaith dialogue, is that they feel that in Britain at the moment, the, their inter, the interactions between Jewish communities and Muslim communities, and in, in fact Christian communities, have never been so bad in their memory. And that the word they would use is to say the Jewish community is primarily defined by an emotion of fear and Muslim communities by an emotion of anger. And that it's very, very difficult for them to try to bring communities together at the moment. Mm. I mean, look, you, I, I sent you the email. I didn't send, I didn't send it more widely, but I, I, I was also quite shaken by it um, because it was pretty brutal in what it was saying about us about what he assessed as to be our views. And yet, it's this is what's been so difficult about the whole thing. So on the day that he sent that email, or maybe we should come back to it, we should ask his permission and come back and say, well, could we go through it maybe line by line and talk about why we think what we think, why we say what we say. But on that very day, I was at a an event in Croydon where I had to be, as I said last week, I had to be sort of dragged out by the police because there was, I was surrounded by protesters who basically saw me as a kind of Zionist war criminal um, because they, in their eyes, we're far too sympathetic to Israel and we're not, we haven't, neither of us have said the words, there should be an immediate ceasefire. And we've both explained why we think that, that us saying that doesn't really add much to the sum total of human debate or knowledge. And I, I actually, I, weird, I, I'm surprised I haven't said it. I do think there should be an immediate ceasefire. Well, I so do I. think that may be something we so, should... So do right. I, but I think the, right. the, the the fact of being... We've been trying. What we said when this whole thing, thing happened on October 7th, you remember we had a discussion yeah. where we said that we, we should try to explore the complexities of all of the issues involved. So we got criticised, for example, for having the Palestinian ambassador on, but I thought it was a very interesting perspective from... The Palestinian view. We had various people from the other side, and we've we've continued to try to do both sides. But what the difficulty is, those people who were throwing things at me in Croydon, they will only listen if we are saying the things that they agree with. And likewise, the guy who sent us that email, unless we're saying completely what he thinks, and I, I can't sit here and say that I agree with Benjamin Netanyahu's strategy in this. I can't. I can't say that I think he's a good prime minister. I can't say that there hasn't been horror and brutality on both sides because there has. And then you get into the whole what about tree. And what I, all I think we've been trying to do is to say to people, it surely should be possible in a mature democracy like ours to feel horror and revulsion at what's happening to the people in Gaza, whilst also, also trying to keep ourselves in the minds of people the hostages, the families of the hostages, and the people who were killed and their families on October 7th. Um, but it's almost like you can't do that. You have to be absolutely yeah. fixated on one side. And that's what I find very, very troubling and alarming and polarizing about the whole thing. And, and of course, it, it is also a, a lens onto other world events. I mean, it, it is the same, I'm afraid, on issues like Kashmir. Yeah. You know, if I talk to educated, very liberal, progressive Indian friends in India about Kashmir, I get an absolutely sort of determined uh, view on one side, obviously in Pakistan on the other side. Mm. I mean, there are, there are, you know, again, with Serbs, we've been talked about the threat with Serbs in relation to Kosovo and Republika Srpska, uh, the incredible difference between Rus way Russians perceive Ukraine and the way mm. Ukrainians perceive it. Um, I mean, it, yeah. I'm, I'm currently banned banned from Russia by the Russian government for what yeah, I've said on this absolutely. podcast. But Rory, if you think about what we said on the main podcast in relation to those speeches at the weekend in Northern Ireland, I don't think that 20 years ago, either of those two politicians could have made the speeches that they made. So that may be that there is a Palestinian politician today whose name we don't even know, an Israeli politician as well, who hopefully in 5, 10, 15, 20 years may be able to say 
those sorts of things because we have managed somehow to get through this current mess into a place where the two-state solution starts to mean something again and then a process that takes us towards that. So if we all get sort of locked into our tribes where we, we don't even, we aren't even willing to receive the other person's opinion. I mean, the guy who sent us that email, I know this because you and I have talked about it. We, he has really made us think about things and that's why we're talking about them now. But, you know, I'd also like him to think about what, what limited role we are trying to play by having the conversations that we're having about this. Yeah. Um, well, I think connected to this, maybe Rachel Hughes lobbying, thinking of lobbying. Do you get lobbied to cover or not cover specific topics on the pod? <laughs> Who by? So I mean, obviously that was an example of an angry person uh, trying to get us to put the that side. In fact, I've just received to give, I mean, I think it's good to be transparent about this, how these things work. I've just received a text from the Israeli embassy that's obviously worried that we're not putting the Israeli point of view. Would I come and have breakfast with the Israeli ambassador? Can they put an Israeli government spokesman on? Um, I was uh, at a drinks party up in North London where um, I was lobbied to cover old people more. Mm -hmm. It's accused the fact we don't cover aging enough on the podcast. Well, even even though um, we've got an old person as one of the presenters. <laughs> I don't, don't, don't think you're going to get Do away I not with qualify? that. Okay. I don't okay. think you get away with that, no. Um, and of course, you know, many of the... Um, Issues that are drawn to our attention by people reaching out. Um, you know, well, I, the, re I was, the reason, uh, the reason, the reason that yeah. we led the Q and A today on the Labour uh, twenty-eight billion pound green investment plan is because that was the subject this week on which we got the most questions. So I yep. suppose that's a that's another form of. We also get we shouldn't sort of name too many names, really, but we do get all sorts of people desperate to come on leading. Um, that is true, and some and, of them, and, and we would like to apologise for to many of those people who <laughs> have been suggested. Often, it's maybe not their fault. I think it's their book publishers have suggested that maybe if they know Rory and Alistair, they could come on leading and sell lots of their books. But yeah, yeah. Um, but unfortunately, we are not able to uh, have everybody on leading. Um, now, talk about so leading. What do you, what, what, um, yeah. Hamza, yeah. Just what, just one thing. Yeah. Hamza, Hamza Yusuf, who's the latest. Yeah leading and i know you liked him a lot yeah. we got we got a lot of coverage um for what he, for what he said about his own mental health which i thought was, i thought he talked about that lots before but it seemed that people were interested in him going into the detail that he did and being very open about the fact that he thinks he should probably do it again go and get counseling because of the stresses and strains of politics and life um, Did people cover it sympathetically, or were there were political yeah, very. opponents trying to do it? In, it wasn't, in the it main, wasn't very. an attack on him. Yeah. No, in the main, very, very sympathetically. It basically, just taking what he said, um, I didn't see anybody being terribly critical. I saw, you know, loads of sort of criticism online stuff, but no, in terms of the, you know, I saw about 10, 11 newspaper articles um, online, and and in fact, after this podcast, you're going to see a serving prime minister i'm going to be doing an interview with bbc scotland about the interview and about mental health and politics so i thought it was a very good interview and if people haven't listened to it i strongly recommend it um fiona thought i was a bit harsh on him in, in our sum up but i think I, was, <laughs> I think I was probably trying to balance up your utter fanboydom my, my fanboydom yeah which which because has maybe many friends with scottish unionists oh what, I, a, I, shame. what a shame what a shame oh yeah what exactly shame. there we what are um um murray hardy do you think celebrity endorsements of politicians have been helpful in the past and how big an impact could they have nowadays? Should Labour chase them to appear more exciting? I'm very sceptical about this. I've got two data points on this, though. Mm -hmm. One was, of course, that Stormzy came out strongly for Jeremy Corbyn, and it didn't actually win Jeremy Corbyn the election. Um, but maybe that's not a good, a good data point. Um, a stronger data point was um, I was talking to someone who uh, Posh Spice, Victoria Beckham, had read... Uh, their book and had posted on Twitter and she has millions of followers on Twitter, mm. how much she liked the book. And he rushed to Amazon to see what had happened. And it turned out that as a result of this post, which was seen by millions of people, exactly three of his books were bought. Um, so that made me think that maybe people don't follow celebrities for their views on things which are outside. So maybe if you admire Stormzy's music, it doesn't necessarily mean you follow his politics. You may really admire Victoria Beckham's um, fashion line, but you're not particularly interested in her recommendations on books. Yeah. Yeah, what do you think about that? Um, I th I've never thought it's that big a deal, but I think they're kind of quite good to have. 
um, as part of a sort of general positive mood music. And there is a, you know, I briefly mentioned in the main podcast, the Taylor Swift Trump stuff. This is becoming a, a huge story in the in the States because um, she's she's now involved in this romance with this American football star, Travis Kelsey. And because she is an open, avowed, less not just a supporter of Biden, but a very, very strong opponent of Trump, She's now become the sort of victim of these massive conspiracy theories that the whole relationship is, has been sort of put together by the Democrats and by the, the PSYOPs team in the Pentagon. Um, <laughs> that, and, and, and that guy, um, the one who dropped out, Ramaswamy, he yeah, has basically Vivek, said that yeah. the he's basically said that the Super Bowl next weekend is going to be rigged so that Kelsey's team wins, and then there's going to be the endorsement of Biden between <laughs> the two of them. And the whole thing is utterly insane. Um, but what's interesting is that the the the, the Sorry, MAGA Vivek Ramaswamy thinks they're going to rig the Super Bowl. Yeah, yeah. so that so that Kelsey can um, can come out with Taylor Swift, and, and the thing is that they're all going. If you turn on these kind of right wing shock jock people, they're all sort of you know filled with hate for Taylor Swift. Now, the thing about Taylor Swift, look, Donald Trump has a very big, loyal, devoted, dedicated fan base, right? But so does she. And I thought the other thing that was interesting last week, I don't know who it was, but some kind of heavy metal guy. Um, and I guess there's quite a lot of kind of, you know, Trumpian mood music around that. And he stood up in front of this huge, huge crowd and basically said, any of you go after Taylor Swift, you're going after me. And so this sort of, I don't think it necessarily shifts votes, but I think it can be a very important well, part of the well, mood. One of the big things for us to look for is what Arnold Schwarzenegger does, because he refused when we interviewed him on leading to mm. come out clearly against Trump. He kept saying, well, it's just hypothetical. He's never going to make it. He's got all these law cases against him. He's not going to be president. But he is somebody who a lot of the Trump base does take seriously. And it'll be interesting to see whether if he comes out against Trump in the last days, whether he has the credibility and weight to carry people with him or whether, as he presumably fears, he's just going to be thrown aside and now takes Trump's side against him. So, uh, Alice, a final question from both of us. Tip for everybody. On an ancient recording, this is Keith Pollard of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Alice's wife, Fiona, mentions that he's a creative genius when it comes to Valentine's Day gifts. What's the secret? Roy, you've seen the clip of me on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. That <laughs> is like a, I had a shiver down my spine when you mentioned it because <laughs> it was without doubt one of the worst television appearances of my life. Um, I'm not going to relive it now. Of France. Not United States. No. You've just lost £3,000. But fair to say... It wasn't a good day for the charity that I was representing. Oh, oh, well, well, um, with Valentine's Day coming up, you might want for next week tell well, us a little I bit about you, Valentine's Day well, gifts. What, what I do is what I do with with gifts generally. I'm not I, I'm not big on gifts for lots of people, but I do try to get things that are very very original. Um, so that are often made might be something that's painted, might be something that's sculpted, might be something that's just a uh, um, I'll give you one very good example. I, I sometimes write music and then get the oh. music frame, stuff like that. So well, that's, that's schmaltzy, that's, romantic kind of bullshit stuff. That, you know. It's very, and very And then, then Fiona, very, of, Fiona looks at it and says, mm, yeah, thanks. That's too yeah. too high, high a bar <laughs> for the rest of us. All right. <laughs> Goodbye. Happy Valentine's for next week. Speak no, soon. Rory, don't, please don't say happy Valentine's Day. I mean, Fiona's the only person... <laughs> I mean, people really will begin to talk if you start saying, yeah, anyway, that's have, a lovely, have a lovely rest of week. Have a lovely rest of week. Bye-bye, Alison. Bye-bye.